Hi, my name is Paul Lohjesen. I'm a technical artist at SideFX. I uh, am part of the game development team at SideFX, focusing on the game segment, and I'm also one of three developers working on SideFX Labs. So today's presentation is called uh, Wave Function Collapse Supercharged with PDG for Level Generation. So uh, this presentation um, is all about uh, the implementation of the Wave Function Collapse algorithm in Houdini and some explorations that uh, I've been doing with this algorithm to sort of see what is possible uh, with it inside of Houdini with you know the vast variety of, of tools that Houdini already offers. The presentation is meant to be a demonstration of a potential workflow and of course as an inspiration for um, more complex projects that you might have in a production environment. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to uh, Maxim uh, Gumin uh, who is the original developer of the algorithm, and also Oscar Stahlberg, um, who has been posting some really awesome stuff on Twitter. Uh, so definitely check those two individual, uh, individuals out. Uh, so to begin, uh, here's, a, here's two uh, screenshots from uh, the project inside of Unity, uh, where you know I was almost done with the, uh, the project, or at least I was happy enough with it, where it was in a stage where I could you know, turn it into a presentation. Um, so that, those are two screenshots. This is just an in-engine uh, fly-through of, of a potential level that you might generate. The lighting is uh, not the same as in the screenshots, um, but it, it looks a lot better if you go into play mode. Um, but yeah, so as you can see, everything in this level, in this viewport that you see, has been placed uh, automatically using Houdini Engine with, of course, Houdini running in, uh, under the hood running wave function collapse as a, a SOP tool in Houdini. So as you can see on the bottom right, I have some parameters exposed, uh, one of which is a seed parameter and a, a bunch of other ones, which we'll uh, get into uh, further on in the presentation. But as soon as I change any of those parameters, the entire level will regenerate and uh, produce a result that corresponds to that parameter change. Uh, so that means that you know I only have to play with that to get a completely new level uh, opening up a lot of doors, of course, as you can imagine. So uh, in this presentation, uh, we'll be talking about lots of different stuff. We have a wide variety of things to show you. Um, but this slide just gives you a brief overview, a visual overview of uh, what it is we'll be going into. So to begin with, uh, we'll first look at how the algorithm works to get a better understanding of how to use it and what it is you can do with it. Then we'll look at the actual implementation of the algorithm in Houdini and the tools that we, uh, we built uh, for you to use it without any sort of setup uh, required. We'll uh, do a quick look at the, uh, the project we did last year at GDC uh, because it has quite a few similarities uh, to this project. Uh, and this, this sort of project builds upon those experiences from last year. We'll be looking at something called Wang tiles uh, to decode a black and white image into uh, uh, tiles from a tile set. We'll be looking at uh, an innovation on wave function collapse uh, that I've built, which I like to call uh, a multi-res grid. And we'll be looking at some cable generation using Vellum and a fine shortest path. We'll also be looking at uh, generating quad trees uh, to determine light placement of, uh, of, of lights inside of the engine. And we'll also be looking at PDG. Uh, the PDG part has been scattered throughout the presentation and throughout the project because it has been a really big help in achieving a lot of things, as you will see. So on today's menu, the things that we saw uh, on the previous slide have basically been chopped up into three different segments. First of all, we'll talk about the, the, the algorithm itself in sort of you know conceptual uh, manner. Then we'll be looking at the actual algorithm in Houdini. How was it implemented and what is it you can you, you could do with it and then we'll be looking at actual use cases the main one being uh, individual components used for the level uh, creation the presentation uh, does uh, assume you have some basic knowledge of uh, pdg um, and and some vex uh, and once again the present this presentation is not a technical walkthrough if you don't have any experience with pdg and vex you know not that big of a problem but you might uh, hear some, some words that don't make a whole lot of sense to you. Uh, so that's just a quick disclaimer. 
Uh, so what is wave function collapse? Uh, wave function collapse is a procedural uh, generation algorithm which produces images by arranging a collection of tiles according to rules uh, about which tiles may be adjacent to each other. Uh, while it is solving these tiles in an output image based on an input image, it does this based on uh, how frequently these so-called patterns appear in the input image. The algorithm has two different modes, or at least you know, that, that people use. It has an overlapping model, uh, which is the one that we have implemented in Houdini, and it has a simple tiled model, uh, which we won't really be covering today. Um, so basically, the algorithm is a, is a constraint solver. Uh, think of it as, um, as you solving Sudoku, right? where you have a set of uh, values or, or cells that you have to fill with a value, and the value of those cells depend on the neighbors or a collection of neighbors of numbers next to those cells, right? You, you can't have, for example, a one in a row or twice in a row. Uh, so that's, for example, a constraint in uh, Sudoku. So it's sort of similar, but a little bit different. And we'll be looking at, uh, at, at what that is in more depth in the next couple of slides. Another thing uh, that is very important in wave function collapse is something called local similarity. Uh, local similarity is determined by uh, an argument which is called n. Uh, I will refer to it as sort of cookie cutter size in this presentation, which will make a lot more sense in um, the, the next couple of slides. Uh, wave function collapse is open source. It's, it's freely available on the internet. Uh, the link can be found at the bottom of this presentation, so github.com slash mxgmn slash wave function collapse. Uh, and the original implementation is in C sharp. So um, let's take a look at what it is the actual algorithm does when you feed it an input image. So let's say you have this input image, which is just a, a bunch of pixels. Let's say this is 16 by 16 pixels. Then the first thing we do is we take that image and uh, we duplicate it so that we have a grid of those images because with this uh, cookie cutter that we'll be placing, we'll be uh, moving that cookie cutter one pixel every single time, which means that as soon as we've reached the, the pixel all the way on, on one of the edges, it might overflow and therefore needs to wrap back to the original image, which is easily achieved by just duplicating the images around it. So here we see that, that cookie cutter I'm talking about, um, which is essentially that n value. If n is equal to 3, the cookie cutter size is basically size of 3. So it would you know, stamp out a 3 by 3 a grid of pixels from the, 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 the uh, input sample image. And that would give us a, a pattern, which we can see on the, the top right of our screen, right? So you can see the pattern is exactly the, the pixel data that comes out of that cookie cutter. Then we're going to do that for every single possible combination of pixels in an image. So of course, what we can do is we can just go from top uh, top left and then move one pixel over to the right, and we can do that and do that for every single row, giving us you know lots of different uh, patterns. And as you can see, we can even have duplicates, meaning in the output image we'll see that more often than you know one of the patterns that only uh, show up once in the input image, for example. So in the end, uh, we might end up with uh, 35 unique patterns out of this image, right? Uh, important to know is that if you increase n or your cookie cutter size, most of the time you'll get more patterns because you know there are more unique values because if if you have a smaller cookie cutter size, for example, a two by two one, you will have lots of duplicates, will, which will reduce the number of unique patterns that you can extract from it. Uh, therefore, reducing the, the similarity that your output image will have to the input image that you provide it. Same goes with uh, a larger uh, cookie cutter size or larger N. It will take a longer time to solve because there are more patterns, but it will also look more like the input image that you provide it. And here we can see that in a more visual manner. So in the top, we can see our, our input sample image. And then at uh, the, the bottom of, or below that, we can see what the output would look like if we were to change n from 1 to 2 to 3. As you can see, uh, n equals 1 is more sort of, sort of uh, a visual noise. 
because uh, it simply looks at, for example, a red pixel um, in the original input image, and it sees, okay, a red pixel is allowed to be next to a black one uh, or is next allowed to be next to a green one. So it is quite random, right? It has lots of, of, of options uh, that it can place down because it's simply uh, uh, very common that that occurrence uh, exists in the input image. If you look at n equals 2, we can see that there is already more structure because we're looking at patterns that you know have a 2 by 2 piece, therefore there are less or more patterns and therefore more constraints. If you look at n equals 3, it becomes a, more, a lot more uh, interesting, makes a lot more sense, which is why n equals 3 is usually the default value for that argument. So, how does the actual solving happen? So now that we have our patterns, the idea is to basically use those patterns to fill an empty grid, which we see in the, in the bottom left, to become something that we see in the bottom right. So we start with an initialized wave function collapse grid. Let's say a 50 by 50 pixel image. What we do is we fill every single cell with a list that contains all the possible patterns that you know, we found from our input sample image. Then what we need to do is we need to do a solve, right? So we pick one cell and we just assign that a random value. We do some more magic, which we'll talk about you know, in the next couple of slides. And then we need to propagate all the cells around it to sort of reduce the number of uh, uh, patterns that are allowed because you know, we've, we've uh, increased the number of constraints which then results uh, with a fully collapsed grid where every single cell just has one possible solution and therefore has a pixel or a pattern value that will result in the output. So let's take a look at that, that solving step and the propagation step. So imagine we've done a couple of iterations of, of, of solving, right? So let's say we, we're at a stage in the image that we see right now. Imagine the white pixel values to be cells that have not been solved yet, right? They have you know, all possible values that existed, all these possible patterns, the 35 values. The green and the black ones are grid cells that have already been collapsed, right? They have been given an output value. So then the first thing we need to do is we need to find the lowest, uh, the lowest entropy cell. Lowest entropy basically just means uh, the cell with the least possible solutions. Think of that Sudoku example again. How would you solve a Sudoku? You would always just look at the cell that is easiest for you to solve, right? Because as soon as you've solved that cell, uh, the cell next to it or around it will also be easier to solve because you've made it easier for you to find a solution. And that's why typically uh, you solve the lowest entropy cell as uh, the next step. Once you pick that lowest entropy cell, we need to find uh, which patterns are compatible with it. So we look at all of the patterns that are still existing in our uh, in our cell, right? So of those 35 original values, and um, what we do is we look at all the patterns that are there and take the top left pixel of our pattern and put that on the exact location where that red pixel is here, right? The cell that we want to solve. And as you can see here on the right side, we can see that this, uh, this value, this, this uh, pattern, fits exactly on top of uh, the other values that were already placed, right? So this, this top green pixel goes on here, this green pixel goes on there, and the black pixel goes on there. So there is no collisions with already placed pixels. If we were to place, uh, try and place this one, we would run into a problem because the top left pixel is perfectly fine. The middle pixel will align with this one, but the green one would collide with the with the black one, and therefore this would not be a possibility, and therefore we can discard it, right? So as soon as we we filter this list with the patterns that do fit, uh, we if there's only one, we just assign that one. If there's multiple of that, we just pick a random one and assign that. So that's the bit of randomness that that you have with this algorithm, which is what a potential seed could control. Then once we've picked a cell uh, or a pattern that we like, we can assign that pattern to the cell and therefore we have collapsed this pixel, therefore going to the next step of our solve. And then we keep doing that over and over and over and over until we've uh, either solved every single step or until we've run into a contradiction. 
A contradiction basically just means that uh, we've we've run into a scenario where we're trying to solve uh, this pixel here, right, the lowest entropy cell, and there is no possible pattern that fits on top of that. Uh, meaning we, we result with a, a cell with a, a value of zero, meaning we cannot solve it. Therefore, we would either have to discard all the work we've done before and change over with a different seed, or we could do something called backtracking, but that is something that we haven't implemented in our current implementation in Houdini yet. So uh, looking back at uh, this overview, I hope it makes a lot more sense to you what is happening in the uh, the animated GIF on the right side, right? So we have this this and how an input sample uh, controls together with the arguments of the arg uh, algorithm the output of the image. So if we were to take that cookie cutter again that we looked at before and we were to place it anywhere on the output image and look at the values of that let's say three by three cookie cutter that would exist in our input sample image. So the larger n is, the more similar it will be to our input sample. The smaller n is, the more freak, uh, visual noise we'll get. Uh, and yeah, so that, that's basically what the what the algorithm does. Think of it as Sudoku once again. So now that we have an understanding of what the algorithm is and, and, and how it works, roughly, we can look at the implementation that we've done in Houdini. So you don't necessarily need to understand how the algorithm works in order to use it uh, with these Houdini tools. We've given you three different tools that you can use uh, to utilize wave function collapse in your pipeline. First of all, we've created an, uh, an initialized tool. All this does, it, it, it just creates a grid for you. And it also already sets up the attributes that the wave function collapse algorithm will use to do the solve. Next up, we've created a tool called uh, Sample Paint, which is a Python state tool that interactively allows you to create uh, a sample which the, uh, the wave function collapse algorithm will use to create a new output. We'll, we'll look at uh, these, these tools uh, individually on the next slides. And then of course we also have the solver which does, does the actual solve uh, which we'll also dive into in, in the next couple of slides. So as for the initialize grid tool, it's really simple, like I said, it just creates a grid uh, which we can see here and uh, we can control the size of the grid of course so in this case it's set to 21 rows and uh, 23 columns and it also already created our name attribute for us uh, so that the wave function collapse algorithm uh, knows what to use. Then uh, you can also uh, tell it to use or initialize the grid using a texture which is useful for using it as a sample image that you can plug into the uh, algorithm. And then Later on in the video, as you could see, uh, I just visualized that by copying some grids onto that grid, and I just uh, set the color of that to be the value of whatever the image was. So it's easy for us to visualize what it is that our, our wave function collapse initialized tool set up for us. So it's a really straightforward tool. Next up, uh, this is the sample paint um, tool. So once again, we first create a new grid with uh, the, the attributes that the wave function collapse tool needs. We then have a stash node, which has uh, geometry on it. So in this case, there were all sort of pipe pieces. And then the wave function collapse sample paint tool, uh, which allows us to initialize uh, the multi-parm we see on the top right with all the individual pieces. And it just automatically set up a painting tool that interactively allows us to, to create this, uh, this sort of input sample that our wave function collapse solver will use. And um, like I said, it's built with uh, the newly uh, uh, implemented Python state since 17.5. Uh, uh, and uh, with scroll wheel, you can you know, um, scroll through all the different possibilities in, in the, the pieces that get plugged into the tool. So this makes it really fun to create samples. And it's a lot easier than having to create you know, attribute create nodes or a wrangle where you manually assign values to uh, a grid. Uh, so you can even take this tool and, you know, customize it to do other stuff with it uh, because it makes uh, life a lot easier. So once, of course, we have that sample, uh, we plug it into the solver, uh, which we will see on the next slide. But I just quickly wanted to show you that the sample we have on the left plugged into the solver will produce the output we see on the right side. So as for the solver, uh, once again, we have our initialized grid tool. We pick an image we like, this sample. It initializes that grid for us, 
And then once we're uh, happy with an input image we want, we can specify you know, what the seed has to be for the solver. Uh, we can specify what n is. And then the tool automatically do our solve for us. So what we see here on the, on the viewport is an already solved wave function collapse uh, uh, grid from that input image. So if we were to change the output size to be 40 by 40 instead of 20 by 20, we would now have an image that you know, resembles the sample image that we have, but looks completely different based on those uh, arguments we specified. If, of course, we change the, uh, the input image or the sample image, we will, of course, get you know, a different looking result. So as you can see, the wave function collapse algorithm is really agnostic of what you plug into it. It really does not care about what it is you feed into it. It simply extracts rules from the image that you feed into it. The implementation of uh, the algorithm in Houdini is also completely in Python. It's uh, easily readable and it's also uh, commented, uh, meaning you can learn from it, you can extend it, you can modify it, you can do whatever it wants, whatever you want uh, for it to suit your pipeline. Uh, like I said, it's the overlapping model of the algorithm. It's uh, just in 2D. You could, of course, extend it to 3D. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Once again, open source, all the tools are open, you can dive inside of them, and uh, it's a real joy to work with. So now that we know what has been implemented, I wanted to jump back a bit to when I started implementing the algorithm and look at some of the earlier experiments. So what we see here is the first two results I got out of the algorithm uh, in Houdini when I implemented it. So on the top left here, uh, I, I just fed in a, a, a 2D a bitmap right in colors and I got back this output we see on the right side uh, back then it also supported 3d so in this case you know a 3d uh, image is essentially just voxels right with where it either has a value or it has no value which then produced this output it was fairly limited in terms of functionality right it, it didn't have a whole lot of arguments uh, exposed or parameters as they were called in Houdini it was also horribly slow uh, 15 by 15 uh, output image took well over 20 or 30 seconds. And uh, back then it had 2D and 3D support. The current implementation that we saw before is a lot faster. Uh, it can probably do a 50 by 50 grid or 100 of them in uh, just a couple of seconds, um, which is why we haven't implemented backtracking because it's just so fast to completely generate a new output. So once I had that working with the uh, 2B, 2D uh, uh, image, I thought, what can we do with this to uh, generate geometry or levels with it? I then came to the realization that pixel uh, values or colors of a pixel are basically just uh, a value, right? What we could also do is uh, just create an image where instead of colors, we would just give every single pixel a string. Right, and string in this case being a path to a piece of geometry on disk. So once uh, I, I basically switched that around to use a name attribute instead of a color, we could already copy over uh, pieces of geometry onto a grid, which is what we see here, which gave some pretty cool looking results that you know inspired us to do more with it. We then thought, you know, can we use this uh, to generate some city or city and roads and, and whatnot with it? So we created a bunch of uh, sample output images, uh, but very quickly we grew tired of um, having to manually change all these values. So that uh, made us look at PDG, because with PDG, uh, the, the most common thing that is used for is wedging, right? And wedging is essentially just creating variations of an output by creating multiple uh, uh, inputs of values in a parameter value. So if you were to create a wedge on that n parameter, for example, where n equals either 1, 2, and 3, the wedge would automatically cook the output uh, with that parameter to be different values. So within a couple of minutes, you know, we, we gave it these different output images and we told it to generate a x number of uh, outputs for that uh, and tell us what the variation number is which allowed us to you know very easily learn what the effect of a certain parameter has on the output because we would we could clearly see in the images perhaps not this one but we could clearly see in the image uh, what the effect of a certain parameter was on the output therefore uh, educating us uh, what to tweak to get a certain output 
So with PDG, um, of course, if you're using a wedge, it basically just transmits uh, uh, values, right? Or uh, uh, variable values that you can set parameter values with. So in this case, all we had to do is just use that network we used manually before. And instead of setting a value in these parameters, in this case, the uh, the pattern search size or, or N and the seed instead of a value, just set it to be at N and at seed. And then in PDG, it would automatically fill out these uh, these values and replace them with an actual value, giving us an output that we see here on the on the left side. So let's take a look at the PG graph, which is also very easy. We wanted to do a variation of input images, so all we did is just point to that input uh, folder where we had the images and just told it take all of those uh, input files, which we can see is ten files. We then told it to create a wedge where um, we're doing three different values for n, which is what we see here. And for every single value of n, do another, let's say, uh, six variations where we're just changing the seed. So for every n value, we will have uh, six different seed variations, giving us a total of 180 different variations. Uh, of course, you know, we wouldn't want to manually take a look at every single uh, value and test it in Houdini. So we automatically rendered that to disk and then wanted to composite that together so that we have the output image together with the input image, right, the sample image, the uh, seed value and n value composited together. And that's really simple in PDG because all we just do is create that ROPnet, uh, tell it what you know attribute values to combine and work with, and it created a composite for us, which all got saved to this folder we see here, meaning we can either take a look at it here, but I also created an image magic node uh, in the network in, in tops that automatically composited all of those output images in one big output image or a context sheet, allowing me to very quickly see how n um, affects the output, how the seed affects the output, and perhaps some other parameter values that I would like to explore some more. So here we can see it's very easy to see the differences between n equal 3 and 2. Uh, and, and how the seed allows us to see different variations. So we could, for example, uh, cherry pick a, a certain seed value to work with or continue working with. So uh, we've now looked at the, <clears throat> the algorithm a little bit more, uh, which means that I want to look some more into level creation with it. So you might have seen the presentation from last year that I did called Rapid Level Creation for Unity Mobile, where the only thing an artist or level designer would have to do is draw a, a level in Photoshop and Houdini Engine and Houdini would create a fully functional level for you. So how that worked is once again, like I said, a Photoshop file where every single layer, for example, a layer with the red dots called uh, uh, enemies or spawns would be interpreted as uh, points where we could just copy over a, a prefab, like an enemy prefab or whatnot where a layer could be interpreted as a scatter, where it would just scatter points on a surface, in this case, you know, the green that we see here, where it could interpret a layer as a decal, where it would just, you know, generate a flat piece of geo, which in this case functions as a road, and uh, the background, which is just a, a grayscale image that has height information encoded into it using the black and white values, uh, giving us this terrain. Um, so to see that in action, I wanted to quickly show that video from last year and how easy it was to set that up. So we first draw our background, right, or our terrain uh, in, with grayscale values. As you can see, we have uh, some more elevation where it is white and less where it is gray, so that we have a playable area and a not playable area. Then where we uh, create a new layer called spawn, which we will interpret as a point. So as you can see, we just took that, that Photoshop level that we had in, uh, in, in Photoshop that we drew, bring it into Unity with the uh, HDA that does all the processing, and already you know, are we generating a level straight from that Photoshop file, right? So there's no need to jump into a DCC or do any work inside of Unity except for setting it up once the first time, right? Uh, but afterwards, it's just a matter of tweaking values and, and drawing literally in Photoshop and then hitting play so that you know we're, you have a level that you can already drive around with. Once you then want enemies, uh, you can draw uh, a red uh, couple of dots or lines. We can add a new layer uh, to create a road. And once we have that, once again, we go back into Unity. We tell it to instantiate the turrets on the, on the red dots and we tell it to create a road for the layer called roads. 
and already we have a game that we can work with. Then uh, after testing that, uh, our, our sketch literally, uh, we can just continue drawing. You know, let's say we want to instantiate some fences to increase uh, the, the gameplay a little bit, make it a little bit harder. As we can see, there we have our fence. Once again, we can just hit play to see if that already works for us. As you can see, it's too hard, so we can go back into Photoshop, tweak it a little bit, tweak the gameplay experience literally in, from inside of Photoshop. Uh, add some more interesting elements such as the uh, the foliage and the grass. Uh, add perhaps some rocks on the road. And then have that instantiate as well. And as you can see, you already have a level that makes it look a lot more interesting already. Once you've done that and you're happy with the sort of experience, you can always, of course, change the type of assets that you know are being instantiated with Houdini Engine. So instead of the proxy geo that we saw before, we can swap it with art that has now been created by the art department or any other sort of art or simply change the sort of style of the game. And now it's a matter of drawing levels and telling the, the HDA to use that different Photoshop file to generate a level with. As you can see, tons of uh, variations in very little time. So what does this have to do with uh, the demo of this year? Well, last year, the artist had to create that input image, right? And if they wanted a different variation of a level, they would have to create a new Photoshop file. But from experience, uh, I've learned that people are very lazy and they want to automate things, which is why uh, Houdini is so widely popular, because it can you know, reduce tasks to uh, very little effort. So what if this year, uh, the artist only has to ever draw a, a, an example once and a tool can generate tons of variations of the level for you. Well, you're in luck because that's what Wave Function Collapse could do for you. So in this case, the input sample image is just this image, right? So this image is sort of like a style guide for the, um, the algorithm that we'll use to generate this level with based on these, these other parameters that you're tweaking. So you would, this is basically an image you tell your level designer, I want these sort of levels where I have a room with corridors uh, and they all have to be sort of connected together, giving us this. However, we now have a black and white output image, right? We have this, which is not yet a 3D playable level. So what is it that we can do with that? Well, we can either uh, ext extrude this and create you know, a dungeon from that, but we could, what we could also do uh, is decode this black and white image using something called Wang tiles. So Wang tiles basically looks at a, a, a black and white image um, and it can decode that bitwise into a, a bitwise tile index. So in this case, uh, let's take a look at a, a simple example, a pixel here in the, in the yellow. What it would do is it would look at all of its neighbors, so the, the, uh, next to it, uh, left and right, top, bottom, but also the four diagonal corners, uh, to see what sort of tile it is and decode it into one of these possibilities we see here, right? Um, and depending on it, we, we might also have uh, 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 variations of that, right? Uh, yeah, so we have that. So that's what we can use to decode our black and white image. Uh, so we rewrote that uh, that logic in VEX, uh, which is what we see here. It's fairly straightforward, might look a little bit intimidating, but if you look at it, it's, it's actually really simple. Uh, but this essentially allows us dec to decode these black and white values to an actual index of a modular piece that we have here, right? So if you were to decode that, we could decode that black and white image to a value that corresponds to any of these 46 tiles that we see here, giving us modular pieces that we can use to instantiate on a piece of geo. So this means that instead of simply extruding a level uh, and, and creating you know, one piece of geo from that, we could have an artist uh, create nice pieces of geo that we can use as modular pieces to assemble a larger level with it. And that's what we did. But that brings up uh, another problem. There is not enough resolution in that original solve that we had, right? Because it's just a low resolution overall silhouette or shape or, or, or bone structure of the level. There's not enough resolution to, to create any interesting sort of uh, object placements, right? Because if we were to look at this image again, we could see that this, this piece here only has three pixels in width and four pixels in, in height. That's not a whole lot of, of pieces that you can place, right? Because every single 
uh, pixel corresponds to one piece of geo. So that brings a problem to us. Uh, but that's where uh, I came up with this innovation called uh, a multi-res grid for wave function collapse, where we're essentially going to do a wave function collapse solve inside of a wave function collapse solve, right? Because as you can see here, these pieces are a lot smaller. There are a lot smaller cells that we've you know, placed inside of a level. So to visualize it a bit more, uh, I created this example where imagine that these rows are sort of walls, right? And this, these big flat pieces are essentially a room that we want to you know, go deeper into, essentially. So then once we do a solve inside of there, we can see that we've generated a higher resolution wave function collapse solve inside of <clears throat> that lower resolution solve. And we can do that as many times as we want. So we can pick another one and do another solve inside of there. We can pick you know, another one and go another level deeper. And we can do this as many times as we want. Uh, but for this particular demo, we just went with uh, one layer because that was sufficient to demonstrate the sort of purpose of, of the multi-res grid. But as you can see here, it can also be used to you know, generate some really interesting uh, output images, which you simply cannot generate uh, using the, the, the base uh, algorithm. But that's why it's open source, right? You can extend it, you can modify, you can do anything with it, uh, and, and that's why the algorithm is so great. So, to generate the level we see on the right, we have two input images. We have the image that, that controls the sort of skeleton of the image, of the, the level, the body. And then we have another image which allows us to control the level content. So this should already sort of give you an indication that uh, if you were to create tons of, of uh, different style guides for the level content, we can have different sort of levels that we can generate. Or of course, we can just keep it to one image and create variations of that by simply modifying the seed, which is what I did in this project. So let's go uh, step by step to look at uh, how that works in Houdini, or in this project at least. First of all, we have our black and white um, grid, right? So this is the output. Uh, might be difficult to see, but we have black points and white points. So the first thing we need to do is delete all the white points, because as you saw in that input, input image, that is not the, the pixel colors that we're interested in. We're interested in the black ones because those are the actual room values or corridor values. Next up, uh, we, we decode that using the Wang tiles and copy over the actual modules that correspond to those pixel values, already giving us the geometry to work with. However, as you can see, there are some smaller floating, floating, floating levels that don't really make a lot of sense for this level. So what I did to remove those is simply uh, generate a silhouette of that level using a labs tool, which is called extract silhouette, giving us this flat shape. Then I use the extract or uh, delete small pieces SOP, also in labs, to extract the largest piece of geometry, which I then used uh, as a group as a bounding object to group the original source point or the original points to only give me the clean original modules that correspond to the actual level, which is uh, great to work with. Then uh, to create the actual content of the level using that multi-res grid, what I did is once again uh, fuse the entire level, uh, flatten it, right? Then what I did is I knew that every single room had these sort of flat tiles, right? Um, they're seen better here, so these dark uh, brown ones. I knew that uh, these have a particular value. Let's just call those floor. So I just grouped all the, the primitives that had that value of floor, right? This, which are going to be the centroids of the level. And then just expand that group by one by just using the group expand SOPs. Delete everything that is not part of that group, which gives us you know, these individual rooms already. Then after doing some further cleanup by just only keeping the primitives that are facing up, we now have this. Then uh, to illustrate it a bit better, we're going to loop over every single room. In this case, I've picked this one because it's quite nice. I group the points from the uh, output of the solve using that piece of geo that I had before. I copy over some uh, grids, right? So that it's easy to work with than just the shapes that we see here. Then what I do is I generate a higher resolution grid that fits around the room that I just generated. So in this case, the resolution uh, is twice the resolution of the original um, 
grid that we generated. We then do our solve and delete all the points that fall outside of the room. So here we see the actual uh, values being decoded into the, uh, the individual pieces of geometry. So the, uh, the, the, the computer desks, the enemies, the pillars, the cores, whatever. We delete everything that is not interesting, right? So everything that is not either a desk or a, uh, an enemy or whatever. We do that for all the single, every single room, giving us these point clouds of objects. We then just copy the objects that correspond to the attribute values on those points, giving us the output. So then let's take a look at uh, what we can do with the data that the wave function collapse generated for us, right? So now we have a bunch of points and, and, and whatnot, but what the wave function collapse uh, algorithm gives us is basically just a grid of pixel values and points, right? They're all, which is very grid-like. It doesn't have a lot of interesting uh, geometry in it. That's something that you can generate afterwards. So instead of having desks that are exactly one unit wide, I wanted to post-process this data and, and massage it a little bit to get desks that have a more interesting distribution in terms of size. So for example, it can be a width of uh, three or a width of one or a width of two instead of simply being a one by one desk everywhere. So to do that, uh, these are the steps that I had to take. First of all, we of course start with just a point cloud uh, of all the desks. So they're just called desk or in my case, obstacle. Then we use a SOP in Houdini uh, that just connects all the points that lie close enough to each other where you can specify a distance. So this was fairly, fairly easy. I just told it to use the distance or connect any points that are uh, either closer or as close together as the, the resolution of the grid is, right? So the grids were all spaced one unit apart. So I just told it, connect all the points that are one unit uh, apart. Then we need to calculate the direction for all these primitives that we generated, which is also really easy because it's essentially just taking point number zero of the primitive, subtract it minus um, position, number of, uh, position of point number one, normalizing that, giving us either a direction that's horizontal or vertical. And we give that a value of either one for the vertical ones and a value of two for all the horizontal ones. The reason I, I distinguish between the vertical and the horizontal ones is because we need to do some more processing on this corner piece, because if we were to have, let's say, one large uh, desk going on the, the vertical piece and one on the horizontal piece, the corner piece would result in a collision. So what I do is I just deleted all the, the collision, or I took the, the uh, all the points that, that are part of the uh, vertical pieces and subtract all the points that would also be part of the horizontal one. So in this case, the yellow highlighted one would be deleted, giving us just the remainder of this. Then uh, we then have a set of uh, primitives, right? That are very long. I wouldn't want to have a desk that is, you know, 10 units wide. Uh, so I wrote um, some VEX that cuts up these long lines into uh, a maximum length of three units. And that's what this piece of code does. So it, the wrangle is set to run over detail because we only want this to happen once, right? It's, we, we don't want to do any of this in parallel. It has to all be in serial. So I created an empty list with no points in it. And then I have a for loop, which will just loop over all the points uh, from the second input. The first input is empty because I'm going to generate points. And then what I do is um, for every single point, create a new point, right? So mirror it and add that to that empty list that I have. Then as soon as the size of that list has become three, right? Because I want to have a maximum length of three, I create a new primitive containing uh, point number zero, point number one, and point number two, part of that list. So that now I have a primitive of with three, with three points. Then I just empty out that list again, and it keeps doing that until it's run through every single point, giving me a nice a set of uh, primitives that have a, a width of maximum of three, as you can see here. Then once we have that, we're going to measure uh, the width of the primitives, uh, which in this case will be either a value of three wide or two wide or one wide, which will then be mapped to an attribute value so that you know Houdini knows what piece of geometry to instantiate onto it, right? Essentially, which desk to put on there giving us this really cool looking result that we have here, which is a lot more interesting if you recall from the previous slides than this one by one desk that we would have everywhere. 
So this is another example of, you know, wave function collapse being used to generate original or initial data and then using the built-in Houdini tools to do further processing on that to create more out uh, interesting output. Next up, we'll be looking at the cables. So most of the stuff in the uh, the level that got generated, it's it's all very grid-like, right? So I wanted to add a bit of uh, or organicness to it, right? Something that does not adhere to those rules of a grid. So I figured, why not create some cables that run from the computer cores to all the all the computers in the level? So I imagine that you you know in a gameplay scenario, you'd have to disable all the computers or destroy them so that you can turn off the core, uh, which would explode or something like that, right? So here we see a more a top-down version of that proxy geo that I work with inside of Houdini, where the black piece is the core, and we have cables running throughout the level, not intersecting with the desks, not intersecting with you know any other big objects, uh, and it looking quite uh, nicely. So how does that work? Uh, first of all, we once again create that uh, that proxy floor that we you know had before that we use for the the multi. Uh, um, uh, grid layer, multi-res grid. What we do is then uh, per uh, floor or per uh, room loop over it, where we have you know these these big cells. What I then do is uh, subdivide those so that we have more resolution to work with. Then I'm going to delete uh, the boundary edges or the boundary primitives, two of them even, meaning that you know the cables won't be colliding with the walls of the room because you know that's not you know, wouldn't look very good, right? Then we take all of our desks that we have, and we're going to boolean that out of the floor that has been rem is still remaining. The reason I do that is because once again, I don't want the cables to be running through the desk. I just want them to be running to the desk. I then delete uh, everything except for the largest piece. Once again, using the delete small uh, small parts tool. Then I'm going to subdivide it again, and once again delete the the, uh, the boundary primitives so that we for sure won't be colliding with any of that. Next up, I just remesh it uh, so that we have a more interesting looking uh, topology, which will be used by the find shortest path in the next couple of uh, operations. Then I take all the edges that you know collide with the desks, right? Because we want to uh, scatter some points on them because we want to have some target points to where the cables will be run, in running to. We then also instantiate a point to where the core is, right? So which that would be over here. And then we plug that into the find shortest path SOP, which essentially just takes in a starting point and an end point. And then it just creates a polygon that goes over the surface, right? Over the uh, floor surface to the end points, giving us these uh, cool looking shapes which you could interpret as cables. Then once we have that, uh, we uh, take our collision objects once again to make sure that you know we won't have any word collisions. We plug that into the Vellum Detangle SOP and that will try and detangle the cables. Uh, it could do a much better job than this of course, but uh, I was fine having some overlapping cables because it just looked a lot cooler. We then do that for all the rooms, uh, giving us you know lots of cables uh, instead of a level. Next up, uh, lights. A level, of course, also needs lights because otherwise it's dark and you can't see anything, which is not very useful. So uh, for that, I decided to use something called quad trees. Uh, so Antagma has a really cool tutorial online uh, showing you how to uh, use that uh, to create cool looking art. I decided to do something else with it. Um, I decided that you can use this to optimize the light placement because wherever you can have a big quad like here, you can basically have one light and wherever you have multiple or, or high fr frequency of grids next to each other, you would need to have more lights, right? Because there is more detail there because that's what the algorithm uh, concluded. So how does that work? Uh, it's basically just uh, two nested for each loops and a wrangle and a subdivide node and uh, an input. So what do we start with to get this output? Uh, well, first, I need to explain what it is. A quadri uh, derives from the idea of uh, dividing a square area into smaller squares. Uh, so looking back at this input here, or the image on the left side, it's a bit bigger uh, and, and therefore easier to understand. 
But imagine if you were to uh, voxelize uh, the 2D level that you see on the right side, so imagine that just being a 2D shape, into equal size voxels. Uh, that would be quite a waste of voxels because um, if we were to place a light in every single centroid of those voxels, we'd have a lot of lights, which isn't necessarily required or necessary in you know, the big center of the level where we could just place one or perhaps two lights. So instead, um, what we want to achieve is have bigger voxels in the center and smaller voxels where we need more detail. In this case, you know, the detail, I just want it to be near the, the walls because I want those to be properly lit. Uh, but we could also, of course, plug in objects inside of the level and then we would also see more detail around those levels. So it's basically an optimization algorithm to uh, compress data, so to speak, right? So how do we take that and implement that in code? Well, once again, we write a little bit of VEX. Uh, so we're going to loop over every single primitive in here and keep subdividing it until we've achieved uh, a certain um, um, rule, right? In this case, uh, we're going to check if the centroid distance, right, for every single primitive that we're looping over, if the distance to the target geometry, which is any point on this white outline that we have, is smaller than the threshold that we have. If so, subdivide it. Uh, so first thing, we take our input level or shape, we resample that, then we overlay that with our input uh, uh, geometry, which in this case is just this quad uh, grid, and then we're going to loop over all of these primitives until they've you know, achieved this, this rule here and we stop subdividing them. So doing that multiple times will, as you can see, subdivide the quads that are close to the output lines of the level, because as you can see here, we're going to take a look at the size of the primitive that we're looping over. We're then going to uh, scale that a bit by a, a scalar that we uh, the user can specify. And then we're going to check if we can find a point on the outline that is closer than that threshold that we've specified, right? If there is no point closer than this threshold, we won't um, find a point, meaning we won't subdivide. But if we do find one, we will subdivide it giving us this really cool uh, structure where we can just extract the centroids and then copy over uh, points onto that. So there we go. We have our outline of our object. These are the, uh, the results of that quadri um, result. We then group all of that using the bounding object of the level. Delete everything that you know falls outside of the level. There's no point putting lights outside of a level. And then what we do is we just plug it into a few SOP where we set the, the fuse distance to be uh, a, a certain value, to be the, the maximum or the minimum distance we want to have between the lights, cleaning this up a bit more and therefore reducing overlaps of lights themselves. Uh, last piece, we'll be looking at uh, PDG. So we've seen it used throughout uh, the presentation for all sorts of purposes, main one being wedging and learning how uh, parameter values affect the output. Um, but I wanted to take a specific look at uh, one of the new labs tools that we've added to uh, PDG, which allows us to um, uh, uh, refine our wedging workflow a little bit. So imagine that we've, we've uh, uh, played around with the seed value of the level structure, right, giving us all these different sort of bodies of levels. But then we're going to pick, hand pick a couple of them. So for example, this one and this one and that one, and we want to tweak them a bit more. Then what we can do is we can use this new labs tool called filter by value, where we're going to say of all these wedges that are incoming, let's say you know we have these 15 levels, we only want to keep the three values that we 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 like, so level with the value of one four one six two eight, and this one and this one, and then we're going to generate variations of the content of that just for these levels, meaning that we'll only get variations of those hand picked or cherry picked levels because we simply like them. Uh, Besides, you know, looking at output images, you can, of course, also go inside of uh, uh, the top net itself and just click on the work items, setting those parameter values for uh, ourselves. We then have our, our, our sample image, which we'll also plug into the tool. And then to test that inside of Unity, we just drag our HDA into the, uh, the hierarchy of the level. We wait for it to cook and instantiate, you know, the thousands of objects that it's generating. 
And there we go. We now have a fully functional level with gameplay scripts, with uh, all the art, with uh, collision, with sound, with uh, with uh, light, and lots more, all placed by that simple HDA. And we just hit play, and we now have you know a, a gameplay scenario of that level, uh, which is literally just a Photoshop file that the algorithm is used to generate a variation of it. Right? It's not even that sample image we created. It simply extracted rules from that image. And then by hitting play, we can walk around in our level. And then if we don't quite like that level, we can of course always change uh, the parameter value of let's say the seed to be a value that we cherry picked from our images that we generated previously. And there we go, we now have a completely new uh, level with uh, a different looking results. The, the levels in this example, in this video, don't look quite as great. Uh, this was before I started tweaking the actual sample image, uh, but this was just a really nice video I recorded earlier on to demonstrate the sort of workflow. Then afterwards, um, you know, we just created a wedge, wedging uh, all the, the content uh, seeds, giving us all these different layouts in those three hand-picked uh, levels that we, uh, we generated. Um, that was it for a presentation. I just wanted to give a quick summary before we uh, we sh uh, shut down of what it is we did in this project, the innovations, the sort of things we explored and the things we did with it. So in terms of PDG, we use PDG for uh, parameter learning, uh, which is also something you can apply for, for example, machine learning or for your own HDAs. It's a really great way of learning how a certain parameter affects the output of your HDA or your, your tool. We can use PDG for scalability. We can tell PDG to literally uh, take this tool that I have and generate thousands of versions of it. I use it for level design, for level generation, right? Give me a thousand levels. Uh, we also enhance the wedging workflow a little bit with that HDA that you know allows you to cherry pick wedges. For the wave function collapse algorithm, uh, we implemented an open source version of it, uh, which allows you to you know extend it, modify it, learn from it, do whatever you want with it. Uh, you can use it for data generation, bitmap generation, level generation, geometry generation, whatever you want with it. Uh, I also extended it with uh, this idea of a multi-res grid, right, where we can generate uh, a wave function collapse solve inside of a wave function collapse solve, similar to you know something like uh, Inception. We showed how you can use Python states to uh, create a more interactive version of uh, a tool to enhance the user experience. We then also showed how uh, you can use any of the, the giant amount of Houdini SOPs uh, to extend what you do with this algorithm, right? So wave function collapse is just another tool inside of Houdini that you can use to refine you know, this data. Uh, you can use them to generate more data from that, like we saw with the cables, for example. Uh, we saw how we can use quad trees for optimal light placement. Of course, it's a very uh, a rough implementation currently, but you can refine it to be a lot more precise or a lot more interesting. We saw how you can use fine shoulders path and vellum uh, to either uh, generate and uh, detangle the cables. And we also saw how you can use this tool that you created in Houdini uh, inside of an engine, like for example, Unity, using the Houdini engine plugin, uh, meaning it's easy deployment. And once again, it works in any plugin, right? So I could take this same project and uh, drop it into Unreal or any other engine like Lumberyard, for example, uh, to generate the exact same thing. So we only need to uh, gen uh, create this tool and workflow once, and then we can deploy many. And that's it. Uh, thank you for listening, and I hope this was uh, interesting and entertaining for you. If you have any comments or um, follow-ups, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to hear what you think of it. Thank you.